What a very good morning to you, church. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve, and I just have the privilege of serving here as one of the leaders of Riverside Community Church. And just from us as a family and also us as a leadership, I know you've seen Craig. We were just on a bit of leave, but it's all the best for 2023. And we really pray that this is a year of fruitfulness and a year that you're able to walk in all that God has for you as individuals and as families. And we really pray that whether it's your family life or your work life or your academic life, that you're able just to grow and continue in the life that God has for you. Now, as we kind of get going at the beginning of the year, it's very traditional for people like me, pastors and leaders of churches, just to try and get us to start well, to maybe preach a sermon or three on the right kinds of things that are going to help us, Craig, start on the right foot. Right, and just maybe some of the habits and some of the perspectives that are going to be most helpful for you and for me as we start off this new year. And this series that we're starting today is going to be something along those lines. But here's the thing, and if you don't know me, I like telling the truth, even if the truth is hard to hear. I would love to be one of those pastors on Instagram and social media telling you that your blessing is coming this year. It didn't come last year, didn't come the year before, didn't come the year before. But this year it's coming, right? I'd love to tell you your breakthrough is around the corner. All you need to do is just put money into a bank account and your breakthrough is coming. Said with dripping sarcasm, right? Here's the thing. The truth is I don't know what 2023 is going to be like. I don't know what your 2023 is going to be like. Obviously, whether you're thinking about South Africa or just globally, we're not entering this year from this very stable, political, economic place. I don't know what's going to happen with our power utility. I don't know what's going to happen with the war in the Ukraine. I don't know what's going to happen with the sense of economic and political instability. And here's the thing. For some of you, 2023 may be your best year yet. And for the person sitting next to you, 2023 may be one of the toughest years they've had to face. And so from person to person, regardless of what is kind of happening in the world around us, 2023 is a bit of a mystery, and I can't promise you anything with any certainty with regards to the environment that we find ourselves in. But here's the thought that I want to start nurturing in our hearts this morning, and that is this. Regardless of how 2023 is going to turn out for you, are there some things that you can do that will give you a higher chance of experiencing and enjoying and knowing life. And by life, I don't always mean the American dream life as defined by the movies, right? By life, I mean when we look at our Creator and when He defines fruitfulness and a life that demonstrates that we have life from Him. I mean, that kind of life. So are there things that we can do that can guarantee to some level that we are going to experience and enjoy and and know a higher degree of life this year? And so whether you get dealt a bad hand, because the other thing is just for us to take things on the back foot, where we just see what's going to happen. And if you get dealt a bad hand for this year, well, sorry for you. Or if you have a great year, well, happy for you. But can we not only be reactive? Can we do some things in faith, meaning I'm going to trust who God is. I'm going to trust that God is present with me, that He knows the year that I'm walking into, and that there are some things that I can do so that I can know and experience and enjoy life to a higher degree than if I didn't. And that is why we're calling this series Sowing Seeds. And that is why we have these sunflower plants in front of us today. 
Now, sunflowers not only are beautiful, but as you know, each one of these flowers produces hundreds of seeds. And each one of these plants came from how many seeds? One. And so the working definition of this idea of seed for the series is going to be that a seed is life potential. Because one seed, one tiny little seed that could have been eaten by you and gone forever, one tiny little seed put in the ground produced an entire plant. And each of those plants produces dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of seeds, each of which has the potential to go on and produce hundreds, if not thousands of seeds. It all starts with one seed. And so a seed is life potential. And that is the metaphor that I want to use for us this series is can we plant some seeds? Can we sow some seeds? And they may look small. They may look insignificant to us. But if we plant them in the soil of God's riches and His grace, there is some life potential that will produce greater life in our life. Now, here's the thing. Even though it's a small step, it still requires an act of faith. And what I mean by that is, maybe some of you are looking at your life, and 2021 wasn't easy, 2022 was even tougher, and 2023 isn't looking good. And, and you're just so deflated. And you just don't know what this year is going to hold. But, but you look at somebody else. You look at their life, and you just see life, an abundant life. And I don't always mean in material terms, but you look at them and they're happy, they're joyful. You look at their relationships. You look at even if they do go through some tough times, somehow they always get through it. And you just see a rich life, a full life. And you look at yours and you're saying, man, there is so little life here. And I don't know how I'm ever going to have what that person or that family is experiencing. And if I can continue with this kind of agrarian metaphor, imagine you've got two plots of land and there's your plot of land. And from your perspective, it's a dry, rocky, weedy, empty plot of ground. And that's what life feels like to you right now. And you look at somebody else and, and their life in inverted commas, man, it's like this plot of land that's just covered with beautiful lawns and they've got some fruit trees and some big shady trees and they've got a vegetable garden and they've got a little river running through it. They've got some shady areas. And you say to yourself, man, there is no way that my life can look like that life. And so right from the outset, you're in a sense defeated and you're just not going to do anything about it. But my challenge to every single one of us, whether your life looks like this plot of land or that plot of land or somewhere in between, is to take a seed. Life potential. And put it in the ground, trusting our God of life. And it's a small step, and it may look completely insignificant, but who knows what that single act of faith can actually do in our lives. Now, maybe you're not completely convinced yet. I'm going to do a lot of convincing this morning. Here's another thought that I have for you, and sorry to sound kind of potentially negative and potentially uh, philosophical, but sticking with this theme is life on average? Is life kind of just this beautiful picture of meadows and rolling hills and clean water and plenty of shade and plenty of life and life just naturally gives its, its, it gives you its abundance? I, I wish I could tell you that's how life is. And I wish I could tell you, just trust Jesus and your life's going to automatically become like that. But you and I know, even if you've been a Christian for, for half a century, you and I know the truth. And the truth is this. And this is the first big thought, and we're going to kind of build on this thought. The first truth is this. 
Life is a mixed bag, but more often than not, life is hard. And again, please don't fall into the pattern of thinking purely through material terms. I mean, this may blow your mind, but those who have more things don't always have more happiness. Don't always have more peace. So life, more often than not, is challenging and is mostly hard. And this is where I think the Christian worldview reflects the truth back to us. You see, when it comes to life, And when it comes to our expectations of what life is going to be like, I do believe the Scriptures speak truth to us. You see, on one hand, we've got the opening pages of Scripture that speak about this loving, powerful God that creates our universe as we know it, and He calls it good. It is beautiful. It's good. It works well. We've got Psalm 19 where the author, he looks up into the heavens and he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. We've got Romans chapter 1 that says, when we look up into the cosmos and when we reflect on it for a while, we can come to terms with the fact that behind this creation, this beautiful creation is a powerful eternal God. And so on one hand, God has placed goodness in this life. But then in the very same scriptures, sometimes on the very same pages, in Genesis 1, we just need to turn over to Genesis chapter 3, and we see the truth reflected to us that when sin entered the world, a curse entered our creation. And the way that is defined is, man, the ground is going to not always be soft and easy, and most often it's going to be hard and rocky and stony, and there's going to be thorns and thistles, and you're going to eat, and you're going to work by the sweat of your brow as you fight this rocky, thorny, thistly land. We get to Romans chapter 8, where it describes that the, the, the creation is in a curse And it is groaning in pain as it looks forward to a different time. So on one hand, we've got, I don't know, Hawaii, the Seychelles, just like places that are brimming with life and beauty. And we just, when we're in those places, oh man, we're just knowing and experiencing the goodness of God. And then we've got, I was going to say Brackpan, but I, you know, if any of you are from Brackpan, um, so the better metaphor is, the other day I, I read about this island. It's a mile off the coast of Brazil. It is called Snake Island because it is infested with a particular type of pit viper that is extremely deadly. In fact, it is so deadly, Brazil has made it illegal to go onto that island. And so we have, on one hand, the goodness and joy and beauty of creation, Seychelles or whatever your cup of tea is, maybe it's the Jarkensburg or the beach or the Rixus Felt, whatever it is. And then we've got Snake Island. And so on one hand, as we navigate this world, we are going to see glimpses of beauty, glimpses of peace, glimpses of glory. And more often than not, we are going to be fighting, fighting with creation fighting to eat, fighting to work. And so the question is, well, what do we do with that? Especially as we think going ahead into 2023. And I want to tell you that I'm I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you. Some of you know that uh, Bianca had an ice skating accident in the middle of December and had to have a hip transplant. And that was just the beginning of a whole bunch of thorns and thistles that we've been fighting as a family. And so as much as I am challenging you this morning, I promise you, I am challenging myself with the very same challenge of faith and perspective. And so the first thought is, as as depressing as it may be, life is a mixed bag, but mostly hard. But the second big thought for us is this. For us to experience life, we have to be connected to life. 
I mean, that's the most logical thought ever, right? I mean, if you're a deep sea diver and you want to be connected to oxygen, you have to have somehow a physical connection. It doesn't matter how much you pray at the bottom of the ocean. You need to be connected to oxygen. And if we want to know life, we have to be connected to life. And this has always been the case from the opening pages of Scripture. Scripture opens up with this beautiful portrait. Some translations call it paradise, the garden in Eden. And this beautiful picture of kind of this idyllic setting of life and flourishing of beautiful trees and just nature giving its bounty to us and Adam and Eve living in peace and there's all the beautiful animals and just having a wonderful time. And as much as I am sure that was so life-giving, And such a peaceful way to to exist and to know God and to know each other. That was never meant to be the source of life to Adam and Eve. See, in the sense of the garden with two trees, one we know is the tree of good and evil. But there was another tree, the tree of life. There was one kind of life that Adam and Eve could experience just enjoying the gift of being in that garden of paradise, enjoying the the butterflies and the trees and the shade and playing with puppies or whatever they were doing, I don't know. But there was a greater kind of life that they could access only via the tree of life. And when sin entered the world, in their fallen states, God had to remove them from this. And this is what He said. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now as the scriptures develop, it's not like all these movies about the Holy Grail where everyone's just trying to look for the Holy Grail. It's not like there's this mysterious tree somewhere that if we look hard enough, we're going to find this mystical tree that is the tree on life. Because as the story continues, we start to see that this tree was a representative of the ultimate source of, of life, who is God Himself. And in fact, there's a couple of interesting dots, and we're not going to join all of them this morning, where kind of the tree of life somehow was an embodiment of God's own presence. Jesus comes along a long while later, and He makes these audacious claims about Himself being the source of life. He says in John 1, 4, in Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. John 14, verse 6, a verse some of us know so well. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. 1 John 5, verses 11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Probably one of the clearest illusions between Jesus' claim as the source of life and this idea of this tree of life is John 15, a passage some of us know very well where Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. Jesus is about to once again in a metaphorical way make this claim that he is the source of life. The next verse says, He cuts off every branch in me. This is the Father, the gardener Father, that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And we're not going to talk about pruning as much today, but sometimes when we experience difficulty in life, sometimes it is the enemy. Sometimes it is your sin. Sometimes it is somebody else's sin. Sometimes it is the fact that we live in a fallen, broken world. And sometimes it is our Father gardener pruning things in our life so that we can be even more fruitful. That's as much as I can say about that today. Let's continue reading. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now remain in me. Some of you know it as abide in me. Those are synonymous terms. As I also remain in you. This is this way of relating to Jesus whereby it's not just I know you, but I'm somehow I'm in you and you are in me. As much as I am in the air and the air is in my lungs, we can have that kind of dependent relationship with Jesus. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. 
fruit being the evidence of life. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, some of you know this passage and if you've ever opened up a book of devotions, almost always somewhere in the book of devotions, rightly so, is a, a, a whole section on John 15 and what it means to abide or what it means to remain in Jesus because of these promises. But here is quite a powerful point that Jesus is trying to make. He's not just trying to give us kind of religious fuzzy feelings. And the point is this, are you convinced, absolutely convinced, 100% convinced that life is to be found in Jesus. That ultimate life is ultimately to be found in Jesus. Now some of you say, and it came up in one of these verses already, oh yeah, yeah, eternal life. So in Jesus, that means if I trust Jesus, one day I'm going to go to heaven. But notice that's not how Jesus frames it. In fact, look how John even defines, sorry, Jesus defines in the Gospel of John what eternal life is. John 17, verses 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What Jesus is saying is eternal life, tree of life kind of life, the kind of life that God, who is the uncreated one, who is the only being in the world capable of creating life out of his very own life essence, that life comes to us. Not so that one day we can go to heaven, but it comes to us when we have this dependence, life-giving, abiding, remaining relationship with Jesus, where we are in Him and He is breathing life in us. It just so happens that that life continues for eternity. This is a reality that we're called to walk into now. We're, we're called to plant into now. We're called to experience to some level in part, because one day we will know in full, but we're called to start now. And that journey will go on forever. And so, once again, are you convinced that life is only to be found, or ultimate life is ultimately to be found in Jesus and Jesus alone? Now, if you're sitting here this morning, most of you are probably going, yes, yes, Stephen, the answer is yes, I am convinced. Now, I should have taken some snapshots of some of the songs we were singing, because we sing these things. There's a song that we sing at Riverside, which I absolutely love. You are life. You are life alive in me. And we're clapping our hands. And we're smiling. And we're enjoying being together. And then we go home and we look to other things for life. We go to our jobs for life. We look to even the good created world for life. We look to our habits for life. We look to money and created things for life, the kind of life that only God can give us. Now, if we think about it, everything apart from God that we go to for life, ultimate life, falls into one or two categories. The first category is gift. The second one is trick. Think about the Garden of Eden. Man, what a gift. The trees, the shade, the fruit, the animals, the environment, the peace. That was a gift. But it was never to be a substitute for the source of life. Now God gives us gifts. We as Christians have made a big mistake in our thinking whereby I'm not allowed to enjoy the things that God has given me providing I see them only as gifts. God has maybe given you 
the great experience of a great year. Maybe God has gifted you with some abundance. Maybe God has gifted you with some gifts of some good relationships and some good opportunities. And those are good gifts from God, but they were never intended to replace the giver. We make a big mistake when we forget about the giver and we look to the gifts to give us what only the giver can give us. So that's one category, it's good gifts from God. The other category are tricks. This is where we are deceived. This could be the active work of the enemy, our own sin, our own blindness, our own deception, the deception of others around us. But these are not good gifts of God that we mistake for life. These are things disguised as goodness. Think about the serpents coming to Eve with that apple. Well, we don't know it is an apple. We actually have no idea. And it looks good to Eve. She thinks, well, if I eat of this fruit, I'm going to bypass some of the natural processes of growing wisdom that God wanted to give me. So if I eat of this fruit, I'm going to have wisdom straight away. And so I'm going to take this thing that looks good. But she was deceived. So it was a trick. And in fact, instead of giving them life, It led them on the pathway to death. And so there are things in our lives that we run to compulsively at times, addictively at times. Oh, today it's going to make me feel good. Today this sexual encounter or this encounter with my computer screen. Today just, I don't need to buy this thing, but I know that this thing is going to kind of give me meaning in my life. This time it will. We deceived. Now all of these things, even the, especially the good things, are dependent on the life that God and God alone can give. So once again, when we audit our own lives and where we go to for ultimate meaning in life, are we convinced that life and ultimate life is ultimately found in Jesus. If you're not yet convinced, here's two more quick reasons. Number one, Jesus' life outlives all other life. You want to invest well? You need to invest in the life of Jesus. Jesus says to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, everything else we look to for life has an expiration date. Except for the life of Jesus. And so Jesus' life outlives all other life. But as we've seen in this verse, but I'll give you another one. Jesus' life also outlives death. 2 Timothy 1.10 It has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Maybe you're looking back to 2022 and you just see death. What I mean by that is grief, loss, sorrow, challenge, thorns and thistles, and 2023 is looking no different to you. And at some emotional level, there's something in your heart that refuses to believe that God can bring life into the death of your current experience. Now, I don't say that with any judgments, but I do say this humbly. If that is the case, then do you really believe the gospel? But I'll ask that question with you, not at you. There are so many times where I can't see the life of God because of the obstacles before me. Where at a cognitive level, I know the right answers, but at an emotional level, I'm like overwhelmed by whatever I'm facing at the time. And so I can tell you in that moment, I'm not believing the gospel. I'm not talking about in an eternal salvation sense. I'm not believing it for what it is, because what is the gospel? This verse is calling us to trust it. 
It is life through death. The darkest moments of history became the ground out of which the greatest moments of history happened. The defeats of death itself and the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. And so in these moments, I've got to remind myself, Jesus' life outlives all other life, all other pleasures, all other joys. Some of those I can enjoy as gifts from the giver, but His life is the ultimate source of life. And secondly, if I'm experiencing more death than life at the moment, I've got to remind myself that Jesus' life outlives death. And that is the gospel. So here's what we've covered. The reality of life is a mixed bag, but mostly hard. Just by the way, maybe you're sitting there saying, Stephen, but that's not been my experience. My experience has been life is awesome all the time. And I'm like, happy for you. Maybe you should be on the stage preaching. That's fine. But just do the simple mental exercise. If you had to take everyone who has ever existed, even who is currently alive on planet Earth right now, but let's just extrapolate it to every human being that has ever existed on planet Earth. And you had to define the good life. And then you had to say to them, well, all the people who have experienced the good life, you come to this side of the room. And everybody else whose life has been defined by thorns and thistles and hard ground and more death than life, you come this side. What do you think that's going to look like? And please don't for one second believe that all the people on this side of the room are Christians and all the people on that side of the room are not. Because there are faithful believers, millions of faithful believers, even right now, whose faith dwarfs my faith, but are experiencing the curse in ways that would freak me out. And yet they know life. Life is a mixed bag, but mostly hard. Secondly, but if we want to experience life, we need to be connected to life. Number three, Jesus' life outlives all other life. And number four, Jesus' life outlives death. So what does it mean now? I know today is kind of setting the the scene for the next few weeks. And so today is kind of 99% inspiration, maybe 1% application. But if we had to walk away with with something tangible, how are we going to walk into the life that Jesus has for us? Here's my suggestion for you. I want you to go home and I want you to sign up for a four-year theology degree. As of tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up at four o'clock in the morning every single day for two hours of prayer. And then at night from 10 o'clock till midnight, every single day to read the Word. And then once a week, I want you to take a whole weekend out and go to a cave or a tree somewhere, fasting and praying for the entire time. That's it. That's all. Amen. (laughs) Some of you are saying, where do I sign up? That's fine. The rest of us are freaked out. No, 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 Stephen. I, I, I don't know what putting this into practice looks like. So I'm going to try to break it down in a few simple terms, and then we'll wrap up this morning. But here's what I'm hoping. If you become convinced that apart from Jesus, the vine, we can do nothing. I'm convinced that life is to be found in Jesus alone, ultimately. Here's what I'm hoping starts to happen in our hearts. We get hungry. And when we're really hungry, we start making plans. And so maybe some of you here, it's been months since you've prayed. But something in you is stirring. And you're like, oh, I need to connect to that life again. And so I'm going to do that in prayer. And maybe it doesn't look like a forest. In other words, maybe it doesn't look like an hour a day. Maybe it looks like a seed. Maybe it looks like five minutes, but not five minutes of perfunctory or performance prayer. I hope God's up there watching me. This is the little box I need to tick to be in God's good graces. No, 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 five minutes of desperate prayer. Lord, I need you. I need you above the gifts. I need you above the tricks. I need your life. And I'm going to put a seed in the ground and really engage you. Or maybe for some of you, it's been ages since you've really read the Word in a way that has been life-giving to you. 
So you're just going to open the pages of Scripture and you're going to say, God, I don't always understand what I read. I don't always know what's going on here, but I know that your words are life. And so I'm going to come to you once again, not to go through the motions, but to find life in your word. Maybe it means we're in a world of technology that has its own set of challenges as well as opportunities. Most of you probably know the version app. I don't know if you know this about it. If you have a Bluetooth connection in your car, you can listen to the word while you drive. Lord, that's the only seed I've got. But instead of you know, doing emails and WhatsApping while I'm going, all my phone calls, I'm going to plant a seed of faith in my life. And I'm going to listen to a few chapters a day. What we're going to put on the um, church app for you guys is just a PDF for if any of you feel like, you know, one way I can start is a read through the Bible in a year plan. And I'm just going to start there. I'm going to start off with that 15 minutes per day. Maybe for some of you it means, well, again, I normally, I've got the, the music that I enjoy listening to, but I'm going to find some music that's actually going to turn my heart towards the giver of life in the mornings. And I, as much as I, I really do understand this because I do enjoy worship music, but it's not for your consumption, the mindset is, I just need to connect with the Lord. I need to be connected to life. Just the way I'm wired is music just one of those places that helps. Maybe it means finding a book. You've got an incredible library. It's not just a whole bunch of random giveaway books. Most of them are hand chosen and most of them are brought brand new with you in mind. I'm going to find a book and instead of reading you know, social media for four hours a day, I'm going to read something life-giving. And that's just a handful of ideas for you. But the motive is to connect you to life. And maybe it feels so insignificant to you, just like a sunflower seed looks so small and insignificant. But because that is life potential, and when you plant that life, and you carve that space out in your life, maybe 2023 is a year of abundance for you. I'm just praying that this life gives you more life than any of the other gifts that God gives you. Or maybe 2023 is a year of dry ground. Oh, but you've got this life that does give you life, that does push back the curse, that does connect you to the one who gives you life. And so I'm going to ask as you pray, just to reflect on this for 30 seconds. Just allow the Holy Spirit to, out of all these things that I've been saying that I trust at some level God's been trying to whisper into your own heart. What is kind of rising to the surface? In other words, what is Jesus inviting you to? And I phrase that intentionally because so often it feels like God is telling me to do something. And if I do it, then I'm a good boy and I'm a good girl. No, no, no. What is Jesus inviting you to? And what does that step look like? planting that seed. And just reflect that. Jesus, I'm just hearing your invitation. I am so aware of the mixed bag of the mixed promises of this world. Over-promising, under-delivering. I've been tricked. I've been duped. I've enjoyed your gifts without enjoying you. And so as my Thirst and hunger is just taken beyond the things of this world. I need you and I want you. And here's what I think that invitation looks like in my life. And Holy Spirit, I pray that even now you are bringing clarity to every person here. You are bringing a sense of that invitation the warmth of life and the warmth of relationship with you. I pray that even now there's something in our, the taste buds of our soul that is tasting the promise of life. Oh, and Lord, we need that. We need that. So I'm going to connect to you.
And Lord, I pray that as just a heart conversation is happening around this room, that as he sees a single act of faith are being planted in the ground, just like those fishes and loaves, but just a different metaphor, God, we are trusting you with that seed. Life potential. That that seed can lead to something more. A greater vision of life, a greater experience of life. Not always defined by the good things in inverted commas of this world, but abundant life as you promise. And that, that continues to grow and become fruitful throughout this year. Holy Spirit, would you just, these seeds are being planted in the soil of your word, your heart, your life, your promises. We trust you. Just like we plant a seed and we, we water, then we go to bed and somehow life continues on its own. We do the same with you, Jesus. You do not slumber nor sleep. You are the ever-present source of life. And God, I pray that there are going to be stories this year of life, of goodness, despite maybe stories of challenge, stories of life, testimonies of growing and abundant life. Holy Spirit, this is an act of faith for every single one of us. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May God be with you. May